I'm Chelsea Powery with Castanet News, and welcome to our candidates series with the Penticton Summerland Riding Candidates. I'm here with Roger Harrington, who is running independently. Roger, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to be on board today. We're in the final countdown. What is it, eight days now? Is it, yeah, I guess so. Hey, yeah, eight days. And I'm prepared here. <laughs> little, little political advertising. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I just to just start off here for those who don't know you, uh, a little 20 second introduction. Who is Roger Harrington? Why is he running? So I'm a dad and a granddad. I practiced dentistry in Penticton for 43 years, had a great practice um, with the advent of um, Bill 36, which is the Health Professions and Occupations Act. Uh, it looked pretty hairy, and uh, I actually sold my practice. And then I was working with a group who formed a, a riding association, and we'd been protesting the mandates prior to that, 20, 2021 through 2022. And the group asked me to uh, to run, and I had no intention of being a political candidate. But you are. <laughs> I am, and that's because of four grandkids. I just... I just felt I couldn't turn the province over to these kids in the current state of affairs. Okay. Well, uh, you are running for MLA, so you're you're jumping into Victoria potentially. Uh, no one in this riding running has any experience in the provincial legislature. So can you explain how you would tackle the challenge of being a first-time um, MLA? Jumping right in. So at this point, I have a really good team behind me. Uh, one of whom is a past government worker out of Alberta. And I'm a quick learner. So I fully expect that when we when we hit the gates, um, we're going to be running hard. Of course, there's going to be a lot of, um, a, like a very steep learning curve. But I come onto the scene um, a virgin, no doubt about it. But also that gives me a fresh perspective and I'm not embroiled in the um, the past machinery. I think that'll set me free. And given this writing, so Penticton Summerland, what do you think is one of, or if not the most important issue facing people of this writing? And, and how would you tackle that as MLA if elected? So in August and April of last year, we conducted 330 street surveys on the main streets of Penticton and Summerland. And the top three things that showed up in that survey uh, were the carbon tax and the economy, uh, homelessness, crime, and addiction as the second group. And then the third group was uh, the current health care crisis and the Health Professions and Occupations Act, which is a driver in killing off our, our medical staffing in the province. So that would be, so how would you tackle that, I guess? What, what would be your role as MLA to to get at that. First off the bat, at, at the risk of, of being redundant, tax the tax. The carbon tax is the single biggest thing that's driving inflation in the province. Um, I would look very hard at uh, cutting costs and expenses in Victoria. I think the budgets are hugely bloated. Um, part of my platform is to expose what's going on in the government. Um, I pledge to to remove in order to remove the um, all of the barriers to freedom of information. The freedom of information is really obfuscation. And I would want things set up so that anyone could sit down on their computer and open up any government record to date. We've been doing, we've been doing too much public business privately in Victoria. And you mentioned the you mentioned the carbon tax, and that ties into one of my questions that's on my list here of, of about climate change and whether or not the provincial government has a role in helping mitigate that. So, what are your thoughts on that? There is no doubt that we're encountering climate change. It is an ongoing process, regardless. Um, I do not believe that carbon is the driver, and I, I give a brief demonstration, but. Uh, we're running at 0.04% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 0.03% is produced naturally, so we have no control over that. And the entire global production is tied up in 0.01%. And of that 
Canada produces one and a half percent of that yet. So move the decimal point, another two points to the right. The real producers of carbon in the world are China at 28%, uh, the US at 14%, and India at 7%. And so our contribution to it, one, is insignificant. And I want to just note that at this point, an average tree in Canada soaks up 40 pounds of carbon per year. With the numbers of trees on this uh, in this country, we have 13 times the, the ability to soak up all of the carbon dioxide we produce with our trees alone. So why are we inflicting this punishment on our citizenry? So you, you yeah, so you would say that you believe that um, whether or not, that, that I guess Canadians are don't need to do their part for the global world. They need to do their part for Canadians, I guess. Is it, it am I getting that right? That the... We're already immune by virtue of the fact that we have the so number of trees, yeah. okay? And then um, I really don't believe that carbon dioxide and um, anthropomorphic um, change is a real thing, but it is, I, I believe it's fear mongering by, by our governments. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so a couple of more local issues coming up, but actually at first I want to ask you as an independent candidate, um, it, it's something that gets tossed around that independent candidates don't have as much power in the legislature because they are independent and not backed by a party. So what do you hear when you, or what do you say when you hear that? So there are two issues I get asked about. Yeah. One of them is the vote splitting issue, which we'll come back to. And as you just asked, what is it that I can do? Um, I can I can bring up to the floor uh, private members uh, built. And as such, um, then all I need is someone to second it. Now, the power of an independent is that because I have no party affiliation, I can work with any of the parties in the legislative assembly. I am a direct conduit from the electorate here in this riding right into the legislature. Again, I don't have to it's up to the parties. Um, the, the current phenomenon is that the party system is in abject failure because as soon as the candidates pass through the gate, they, they then turn their loyalty to the party and ignore uh, their electorate. And so uh, as such, I don't have a party leader, so I absolutely have to be in contact with the electorate. And lastly, I have promised to bring forth three monthly town hall meetings where we can engage one another. Um, I can come back and tell um, our people what is happening in the legislature and be, get communication with them so I know what message to bring back to Victoria. All right. So now turning to some local issues. So um, in Summerland, you live in Summerland, uh, the Garnet Valley uh, mine has been a huge point of contention for a lot of locals. Uh, the provincial government, as it exists right now, has given that the green light and uh, people have pushed back real hard on that. So where do you stand on the Garnet Valley gravel pit mine? And if elected to MLA, how would you aim to uh, deal with some of the concerns that people have about that. So I'm fully on board with the pushback against the gravel pit. Uh, my understanding, I attended a meeting, my understanding is that only one of six criteria required for such a project passed with the Ministry of Mines. So I think we need to expose what has gone on uh, at that ministry level and um, and then maybe we're going to look at enacting legislation, but in either case, we have to stop this project. I know some of the, the people up the Garnet Valley. I'm an avid hunter and fisherman. Uh, that area is valuable mule deer wintering range. So that's going to be affected adversely. There are properties directly below where the gravel pit is, and um, they're subject to seismic and um, landslide effects and one of them happens to be the farming outfit local motive uh, who personally supply my my vegetables and a lot of the vegetables in the valley so uh, and then there are wineries in there there is tourism the valley is so pristine i mean to to set that up for a gravel pit and then the road 
uh, was just redone by Summerland and that road is not equipped to handle the industrial traffic. So perhaps one idea is for town council here to um, put restrictions on that road so that those trucks don't operate. Right. And the, another big issue locally on many folks' minds it's around BC, but also here, uh, access to primary care physicians. So what would you do as MLA to make sure that everyone in this riding has access to a family doctor? That's a really big issue. Um, we have we are experiencing a shortage of physicians across the province because the Health Professions Act um, is actually driving them out of the province. We have 8,000 healthcare workers who were driven out because of an experimental uh, genetic treatment back in uh, 2021. And so all of those 8,000 workers have to be reinstated. They have to be reinstated with compensation. And, um, and hopefully we can start attracting people back into the province. But meanwhile, there is still an ongoing mass exodus so those things have to be reversed. And, and those are my proposals for, for bringing them back. And so to be clear, you're referring to the COVID-19 vaccine requirements for healthcare workers back in the pandemic? Yeah. Okay. And so you believe that that was uh, not warranted? That's health absolutely workers. correct. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was dangerous. Okay. Um, and so another issue here locally, obviously housing stock housing affordability being able to a lot of people feeling like they can't get into owning the housing market or even renting in some cases this current government the ndp government has pushed for more housing stock by requiring municipalities to increase density and by placing limits on short-term rentals um, do you agree with this approach and if not what is the best approach to increase the housing stock and increase the ability for people to get roofs over their heads time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> <Two minutes. laughs> uh, okay, so in in my bio, I've explained that I attack root causes. So the, the single biggest driver for housing is a thing called the law of supply and demand. And what's happened is the demand has increased literally exponentially because we have uh, total uncontrolled immigration coming into this country. Currently, Ottawa is talking about dumping another 31,000 immigrants into this province alone. And so um, the NDP stated that they were going to build an additional 104,000 homes like seven or eight years ago, and they've only completed 16,000. So the delivery on that side isn't near enough to keep up with the influx uh, of new people coming into the province. So one of the things that could be considered is to restrict the number of immigrants coming into the province. Quebec apparently has done this. And without being uncompassionate, while we're still looking at bringing some refugees in, I think that we need to be selective and bring people in who have marketable trades, people who come in with capital, people who are professionals. So people who can bring something of value into the province, because if we bring um, a lot of unskilled people in with nothing to offer the province, we're going to end up drowning in taxation to support those people. So that's, that's um, one limiting factor on that side. Um, I think we need to roll back Bill 44, uh, which is the, the Housing Act, which you alluded to in terms of densification. Um, and not because of the fact that densification is a bad thing, but what happened was local communities have lost their ability to review what town council is doing behind closed doors. In effect, um, local zoning has now been moved into Victoria, which is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, provincial overreach and centralization. And therefore, the people in the immediate area have been taken out of the equation. Okay. Um, just to jump in again a, a little bit about that, uh, the immigration thing. Um, so you're saying that British Columbia as a province should have a policy of taking a look at each potential immigrant coming in 
as to their uh, worth in the economy, I suppose. Is that kind of, am I getting that? I think, I think that encapsulates it well, yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm just going to wrap up finally here. Uh, just we're looking at we don't know what's going to happen on October 19th. We don't know whether we're going to getting a, a minority, a majority government, anything like that. But if you were elected, you would be an independent. So you would have an ability to vote with whoever you wanted to vote with on specific issues. So are there any specific local issues that you would be willing to work with any party on because they're that important to you? I think any of the three that I noted at the beginning, I think those are going to be the key issues. Um, I've been asked about climate change and um, those sorts of things. And in our survey, that was like 5% of the 330, so 10 or 15 people in, in approximate numbers. So again, I would go back to that top three listing and, and work on those because those were the things, especially... Uh, the cost of living and the carbon tax issues would be uh, literally at the head of the list. Um, and so, yes, at that point, I'll work with anybody providing that we can move the needle toward those objectives. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with me. This uh, I'm Chelsea Powery with Castanet News. Click to Castanet for more candidate profiles heading up to the general election on October 19th. Mm -hmm.